Director of the International Technology Transfer Center Network Coordinating Office. Uh, we are in Symposium 2, helping faculty address emergent drug trends, innovative curricula and dissemination approaches for university students, residents, fellows, and faculty. We're going to have four speakers today, Dr. Li Ming Zhang from Hanoi Medical University, Dr. Irina Pinchuk from Tara Shishenko National University of Kiev, and uh, Dr. Goodman Sebeko of University of Cape Town, and Dr. Christiana Sista from the University of Indonesia. And I will introduce each of them uh, as they come up. Uh, we will have them give their presentation, and then at the end of all four presentations, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you have questions for any of the speakers in particular, be, please be sure to write them down as we go so that at the end you'll remember and we can have a good discussion. I'm going to remind you now at the start that there is an evaluation for this session as you leave the door. Uh, there's a QR code and uh, you can scan that to evaluate the session. So if you happen to leave a little early, you shouldn't because this is going to be the best symposium here. But if you happen to, uh, please be sure to scan the QR code to do the evaluation. Okay, uh, first we're going to start with uh, Dr. Zhang, who is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Global Health at Hanoi Medical University, Vietnam. He directs the Center for Training and Research on Substance Abuse and HIV a national center of excellence to reduce the burden of substance use, HIV, mental health, and other co comorbid comorbidity among most, the most vulnerable populations of Vietnam. Over the past 10 years, he's led the efforts to build the addiction workforce in Vietnam through technology transfer centers, which I'm sure he'll tell you is his favorite work. <laughs> He has been principal investigator and co-principal investigator of multiple grants funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He is the chief of the Sexual Health Promotion Clinic of Hanoi, Hanoi Medical University Hospital, a unique one-stop shop healthcare facility for gay men and transgender women in Hanoi. Dr. Lee graduated Doctor of Medicine from Hanoi Medical University and has a PhD in Sociomedical Sciences from Columbia University in New York City. Welcome, Zhang. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm told that I get to sit here to uh, um, uh, present uh, because it's easier to uh, maneuver the uh, slide and everything. So um, I'm, I'm from Hanoi Medical University and the uh, Center for Training and Research on uh, Substance Abuse and HIV. Uh, I'm very uh, honored to be here and I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee and uh, everyone to be here uh, this morning. Um, so I'm to going to talk about the, uh, um, our experience in uh, developing research capacity at uh, the center. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, there would be a, uh, many of the lessons that we learned over the past 20 years uh, that, that you already uh, uh, identify. And we, I hope that uh, from some of the lessons that we learned uh, could be shared and, and build a further uh, partnerships and collaboration. Um, so this is the disclosure. I uh, received support from uh, the two uh, companies, the material support for my research, but they are not related to uh, this topic and also uh, currently supported by several uh, grants uh, from NIH, mostly uh, NIDA, but also uh, NIAID and, and um, Fogarty and, and so on. 
Um, so in this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk first about the, how we build the research capacity at the, uh, our center, uh, Center for Training and Research on uh, Substance Abuse and HIV or Creator H uh, at the Hanoi Medical University. Uh, and then I will uh, describe the um, uh, two expertise core of the center uh, and some of the ongoing studies that we have. Um, my uh, next topic would be uh, that our efforts, our uh, uh, current efforts to build the next generation of independent investigators uh, at the center, and I would provide some uh, concluding thoughts uh, from the presentation. Uh, just give you a brief overview of our university. Uh, we uh, established in 1902 the oldest university in Vietnam, uh, not just in health science, but also every other field. Uh, we have about uh, 2,300 uh, uh, staff uh, and, uh, uh, and, and about 12,000 students, half of them graduate students and half of them uh, medical uh, and, and bachelor in different fields. And as in at the university, we have uh, three pillars to research, uh, training, and clinical services. Uh, we have a, a very large uh, hospital. Uh, that uh, of the university, but also our students going to other uh, specialized hospitals in Hanoi. Um, the center is, uh, our center is one of the academic uh, unit uh, under the uh, supervision of the resident, uh, president uh, board, uh, president um, of the university. Uh, it was established in 1994, uh, so next year we'll celebrate our uh, 30 years of establishment. Uh, and it was established in initially as a response to HIV epidemic in Vietnam. And we uh, have, the uh, again, the, uh, the function including training, uh, both pre-service and in-service on SUD, HIV, uh, and STI uh, treatment and care. Uh, we do conduct the research on various topics related to our uh, training mandates, uh, clinical service. Uh, we also provide the PrEP, STI testing, and, and, and treatment uh, at the clinic that I will uh, describe in a few minutes. Uh, currently in our center, we have two cores uh, that I will describe also in detail. Uh, the substance abuse core, uh, disorder core, or SUD core. And the other one is Sexual Health Promotion Core, or SHP. Um, so uh, let me describe the, um, uh, what we have done in the past 20 years to develop the research capacity. And at first, I want to emphasize that building capacity for a research institution in low- and middle-income country like ours is really to build partnerships. And partnerships with multiple institutions, multiple investigators and, and, and multiple partners. So starting from the first row, um, the, row uh, the, 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 the first row that uh, below, uh, here is the, some of the photos that 20 years ago um, in uh, at Columbia <laughs> University where I graduated and also some of the uh, my professors uh, at Columbia. And then we uh, developed partnership with um, uh, colleagues from Oregon Health Science University, University of Minnesota, you can see uh, Professor Gavin Bart, who asked, always asked tough questions. Uh, he raised a question this morning. And then uh, we, a few other colleagues from UCLA, uh, Dr. Walter Ling, Dr. Rick Rosen, who I'm uh, familiar to ma many of you. And on the top row, uh, the uh, photos from the, our recent photos of our collaboration with the faculty from UCLA and from uh, University of Southern California. Uh, so I'm not going to bother with you with all of the details, but I'm going to list here all of the grant support that we receive from NIH that actually help us to build the capacity of our uh, research capacity. Uh, let me just mention a few uh, milestones. One is the first one is that my own exposure to uh, substance abuse and sexual health and mental health was our work with Professor Michael Klatz, uh, a former professor at Columbia University. And our first grant was a NIDA-funded grant on the uh, HIV risk among men who were drinking drug uh, in, in Hanoi, in Vietnam, in early 2000. Uh, at that time, and I was still a graduate student at Columbia University. And over time, we have built together uh, four uh, subsequent grants, uh, also all supported by NIDA and Ford Foundation. And we're very proud to establish the clinic, uh, now become 
the uh, one-stop shop model that uh, uh, that uh, Laurie mentioned in my brief bio. Uh, the clinic is was called Sixo Health Promotion Clinic. That was the one-stop shop, the, the only clinic in Hanoi that uh, provided one-stop shop services for MSM and transgender women in Hanoi. So that was the, the first opportunity um, that uh, came to us uh, from uh, my collaboration with my former professor, and we were able to establish that clinic. And then, uh, uh, lo and behold, uh, I met um, uh, Kevin Mulvey uh, when uh, we were doing the research in Vietnam, and I met Kevin, who was still at that time just uh, joined the U.S. Embassy and was responsible for same cell work in, 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 in Vietnam. And uh, Kevin introduced me to Rick Rawson and then Sherry Larkins, all from UCLA Internet, uh, Integrated Substance Abuse Program. And we um, uh, uh, established together the first uh, uh, addiction uh, technology, the, uh, uh, technology transfer center in, in probably in, in, in outside of, of the US. And it was a Vietnam HIV Addiction Technology Transfer Center and Laurie is right that uh, Technology Transfer Center is my uh, favorite um, uh, uh, work and, and my uh, wonderful introduction into the deeper world of, of drug addiction in, in, in the world. Um, and then um, the ITTC really gave us a lot of the um, uh, foundation for building further collaboration. So uh, Professor Todd Curtius uh, from Oregon Health Science uh, uh, because of the, the, the work with uh, Kevin and, and, La, and, and Rick and, and, and Sherry, uh, he came to Vietnam as a Fulbright Scholar in 2012-13, and then we uh, together developed a, a wonderful uh, study on buprenorphin versus methadone for HIV-positive uh, uh, injection drug users. Uh, and also Professor Gavin Bart, uh, who at the time was a technical advisor for ITTC, for the embassy in Vietnam, uh, we met and then we uh, developed another project uh, together, also funded by, by NIDA, looking at the pharmaco uh, pharmacokinetic of the interaction between methadone and ARV. Uh, and I got a, my first uh, NIDA award uh, in the uh, middle of, of 2012, uh, between, uh, uh, 2014. Uh, it was an, a small project uh, that I worked with my professor at Columbia. Uh, and building on the work of the Sexual Health Promotion Clinic, the uh, PEPFA and CDC uh, supported us, a very large study that following uh, 2,000 MSM and transgender women in Hanoi and building on the Sexual Health Promotion Clinic to uh, follow them uh, over two years. At that time, there was no PrEP at all. So we followed them for two years to understand the HIV incidence uh, of the, uh, the dynamic of, of behavioral change uh, among the MSM and transgender women in Hanoi. And it was the HIM study uh, that was one of the, the study that really uh, pushed us towards developing more capacity in research on sexual health and sexual risk. Uh, and then the, um, uh, we developed further a few other projects that I'm not going uh, skipping here, but now, uh, uh, in the past uh, few uh, years, three years, uh, despite the COVID pandemic, we uh, keep submitting grants to NIH, and we also have got a few uh, that have been funded. But actually, the, um, I also want to note that, uh, that out of every uh, grant funded, we got uh, three applications unscored or unfunded. So I just list the uh, grant that are funded here, so don't don't, don't, don't take it that, that everything that you do would be funded. So let me describe the two expertise calls at the, uh, our uh, clinic, at, I mean, at our center that we have built uh, over the past, and now the, the, the two calls that, um, that we have at the center. The first one is the uh, substance use uh, SUD call, and we have uh, two uh, key investigators here, Dr. Chang Nguyen, who has a PhD, uh, a very interesting background, a master in clinical psychology and PhD in political science uh, from France. And she's a, uh, one of the most productive uh, researchers that I know, young researchers. She has a 19 international publication, 11 as the first author. So she's uh, on the way uh, to become a very um, uh, 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 an investigator to watch in the future. And then we have Dr. Zip Nguyen, who um, 
uh, have a PhD in epidemiology from UCLA and the training uh, at HMU. Uh, Dr. Nguyen also have now 13 publications and uh, she's focusing on the uh, effectiveness of, of treatment, uh, different uh, treatment model. Uh, in the SUD team, uh, we have the research. In addition to research, we are now currently running the VITTC uh, that I, uh, the director, and uh, also we are very uh, fortunate to be supported by NL uh, through Colombo Plan. Uh, this is the two projects that are, we, we are currently uh, conducting. One is a big R1 study that looking at the combination with EBI, uh, evidence-based intervention to address methamphetamine use in, in Vietnam. And building on that, uh, R1, we are now uh, conducting a study on uh, psychiatric comorbidities and recovery uh, among the, our patients uh, to look at how the uh, uh, psychiatric comorbidity can impact the recovery uh, from SUD, uh, especially met in among the people who are on methadone. The second call that we have, the uh, sexual health promotion call, as I mentioned, was a, uh, established earlier uh, in the, uh, as a clinic, and now it's become a one-stop shop uh, clinic where we provide PrEP, we provide HIV screening, STI uh, screening and treatment, and also SUD treatment for uh, MSM and transgender women in Hanoi. And currently, we have about 2,000 active uh, PrEP users coming to our clinic uh, every three months to receive uh, the, uh, the, this is the, the biggest clinic in, in Hanoi or even in Vietnam uh, that, I, that I know of. In this one, we have two uh, key investigators. One is Dr. Hao Bui, who has a, a PhD in public health from uh, University of New South Wales, uh, you know, focusing on infectious disease and STI. And we have Dr. Lok Pham, who has a PhD in epidemiology, and he's a data scientist, and he uh, really interested in the gender-based violence among MSM and transgender women. Um, and here's a few, uh, two studies that we are currently, uh, one uh, is focusing on the STI and antimicrobial resistance uh, in the uh, MSM in, who are receiving PrEP in, in Hanoi. And another one focusing on the uh, brief alcohol intervention to reduce alcohol use among the PrEP users in, 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 in Vietnam. And this is one of the first study that we focus on uh, alcohol intervention and we are collaborating with professors from uh, University of North Carolina. Um, so what's about the next generation? And this is uh, that, I, that um, uh, for the next 10 years that, that uh, I consider this as a top priority for our center that now we have a group of very capable young investigators at the center, how we can help to develop them uh, for the future. Um, I th uh, one of the ways that we do is to push them to submit to international uh, grants. So, for example, Dr. Habu recently got a, a funding from Global Health Fellowship, which is receiving funds from NH, FIC, uh, for, for, uh, Forgotten International Center. And she explored the readiness for healthcare worker and MSM PrEP user to use doxycycline uh, prophylaxis as a method for STI prevention in Vietnam. As you know, that doxycycline is a very new in the, on the horizon for STI prevention. So she's exploring how we can introduce that in, in, in Vietnam. And she will conduct that study under the mentorship of P Professor uh, Gorbach at UCLA and myself. Uh, Dr. Chang, uh, with her uh, publication record, she is uh, planning to submit a, a KO Wood uh, to NIH next, uh, this year, and her research will focus on uh, mental health among women using methamphetamine in Vietnam. And this is, I believe that this is one of very few studies uh, looking at mental health, interaction between mental health and methamphetamine use uh, among women in the world. And she will be uh, mentored by uh, some professor from UNC and myself in, in Hanoi. So this is the, uh, a very, I just want to emphasize that this is the mechanism that are available, available for young investigators from low and middle income countries where you can apply to US fundings for, for, for developing your, your first uh, research. Uh, and then we also at the same time, uh, I myself working with the professor from UCLA, from uh, Emory from uh, UNC to develop the uh, what we call D43 grants. Uh, this is the research training uh, grant 
that support the institution collaboration for five years, focusing on different aspects. So you can see that one of the uh, training that we do, uh, pro training program with, uh, that we collaborate with Emory University, Professor Catherine On Yont, is focusing on violence. So you could ask why violence, right? Uh, but really, violence is a cross-cutting issue among, uh, regardless of whether it's SUD or sexual health or others. So don't be afraid of, uh, of uh, uh, thinking about new topic because there's uh, there's a lot of, of, of cross-cutting issues that that can uh, encourage you to think about future research, collaboration, and uh, developing capacity for SUD, sexual health, and mental health. So in summary, um, I think that for uh, country and institution like in Vietnam, the really building partnership with international investigators are key uh, to building research capacity for in low uh, resource settings. Uh, and uh, building research capacity and maintaining research staff require multiple and consecutive grants. So no matter how large, no matter how small, it's always important to get your grants going in order to maintain your staff. Uh, and it takes really time, a lot of time and, 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 um, and efforts to, uh, to get funding. Only 3 to 5% uh, of application can make the cut at NIDA. So really persistent uh, planning and sometimes fortuitousness is, is important. So take every opportunity that you can uh, to develop uh, the application and to develop uh, collaboration. And I think that the important is to uh, develop the next generation, as I mentioned. And last but not least, I uh, would love to uh, collaborate with other ICUDDR-related university uh, that we can uh, develop joint research together. And I think this is the South-South collaboration is the next horizon that we need to, to move into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. Next, we will have Dr. Arena Pinchuk, if you'd like to come up. Uh, Dr. Pinchuk served as a chief psychiatrist and addiction psychiatrist of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine from 2005 to 2009, and then again from 2012 to 2017. She has continuing experience in clinical work with adults with mental health and substance use disorders, she provides training for undergraduate medical students and postgraduate mental health specialists on substance use disorders and mental health. Dr. Pinchuk organized the WHO Project Mobile Community Mental Health Teams in 2015 to 2016 and participated in the WHO Project Mobile Community Mental Health Teams in 2020 to 21 as a WHO consultant. Over the last 15 years, Dr. Pinchuk participated and led the design and implementation of multiple research and pilot projects in mental health and addiction treatment. She is the author of more than 150 scientific works, including monographs and training manuals. She's also, and again, her favorite job is the co-director of the Ukraine ITTC, <laughs> Dr. Pinchuk. Thank you very much, uh, Lori, for my introduction. Um, dear colleagues, uh, today uh, it is a great honor for me to be here and uh, uh, tell uh, about our activity, um, ITTC Ukraine, and uh, tell about uh, our country. Um, we are living and we are working to gain a very difficult uh, time. Um, the ITTC Ukraine um, uh, was established in 2020 and uh, housed it uh, in the Institute of uh, Psychiatry, the Rashevchenko National University. It is a big university in Ukraine. There are 32, uh, more than 32,000 students in this university and uh, works uh, in partnership with University of California in San Diego, USA. Professor Igor Kutsinok uh, is the uh, director of ITTC uh, Ukraine. In my presentation uh, today, uh, I uh, would like to tell uh, very briefly uh, 
uh, information, uh, uh, only a main point uh, about uh, our two uh, survey. Uh, the first uh, desk review, professional training of specialists in field uh, of addiction treatment in Ukraine, and Ukrainian version of uh, the online course introduction to evidence-based prevention. Uh, also about uh, UTC implementation activities and the uh, challenges uh, uh, 2022. Uh, ITTC uh, Ukraine uh, conducted the study at the end of 2022. The aim of this study is to assess uh, the current state uh, identify problems and uh, determine uh, the direction of development of the system of training specialists in the field of addiction psychiatry within the framework of uh, bachelor's and master's educational program and postgraduate education. The study analyzes uh, more than uh, 90 um, Ukrainian university that train specialists in the field of medicine, clinical psychology, social worker, and uh, uh, nursing. Uh, we analyzed uh, the following program, pre-diploma program in medical university and medical faculty of academic university in addiction psychiatry, postgraduate program in addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine, internship, specialization, continuing education, uh, pre-diploma program in clinical psychology and uh, social work uh, uh, in academic university and pre-diploma program in nursing in medical college and uh, uh, the uh, university. Um, the uh, enrollment of um, uh, the students uh, for the educational program uh, uh, medicine, uh, this is um, the example how we analyzed uh, you know, different program. Uh, this uh, program was carried out by 28 high educational university in Ukraine. 28 of this university teaching, provide teaching of curriculum medicine in English for foreign students as well as domestic students who want to study in a foreign language. Uh, among the uh, compulsory models of the, this uh, educational program, medicine, uh, the model uh, psychiatry and narcology, we have uh, the definition of narcology in our country, this is heritage of Soviet Union, uh, dominate. Uh, continuation of this model is from 30 uh, hours minimum to 90 hours ma maximum. Uh, these uh, basic models uh, is in 22 universities in Ukraine, uh, which is 78% uh, of total number. Uh, some university um, proposed uh, as the only model or uh, addition to the main model programs uh, such as psychology of addiction, uh, in five higher educational institute, continuation of this model is from 20 hours minimum to 30 hours maximum, and uh, basic of prevention of tobacco smoking, alcoholism, substance use, and drug addiction in 10 universities in our country. Continuation of these models is from 30 hours minimum to um, 50 uh, hours maximum. The result uh, of the analysis show the Ukrainian institution um, of higher educational don't uh, pay enough attention uh, to the formation of competencies in the field of addiction psychiatry uh, for training of medical specialists. Uh, we also uh, analyze another program, uh, internship program, social work and nurses, medical, medical psychology. Um, the same situation was found in this program. Uh, do not pay enough attention to the, uh, to the formation of the competition in the field uh, of the addiction uh, psychiatry. Uh, and uh, I would like to point out that um, 
uh, the program Social Work uh, proposed uh, a more information about addiction psychiatry, but we have problem in the program uh, nursing, uh, some uh, program without the topic addiction psychiatry. Uh, important for us for uh, the changing uh, this uh, program. Uh, the main conclusion, uh, the objective uh, needs for a systematic transformation uh, of the professional training in the field of addiction psychiatry. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in Ukraine now we have uh, heritage of Soviet Union topic, and uh, now we uh, decided and uh, started to implement the international evidence-based program in our educational uh, system. Uh, so the next, uh, with uh, the support ICUDR, from March, uh, March 1st uh, last year to February 28th this year, Ukraine took part in the uh, trilateral uh, project, implementation of the introduction to evidence-based prevention, online course, a feasibility study in the different university setting. Uh, besides uh, Ukraine, the project took place in the Czech Republic and uh, Peru. Uh, an article was uh, written based on the result of this project. Uh, we are waiting for the publication of this article uh, in the Journal of uh, Prevention. Uh, the project uh, aim to evaluate uh, the implementation of the INAP in the university setting uh, in Ukraine. Uh, study uh, objectives uh, uh, will translate and adapt the INAP uh, to Ukrainian uh, to assess attitudes and the overall satisfaction uh, of the students towards uh, the INAP and uh, to explore the possible barriers uh, of implementation of the INAP course, taking into account the main issue of actual situation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the challenge uh, of this project was uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, missiles, uh, attacks, uh, air raids, alert during all the period of the study, power out uh, age and uh, lack of internet uh, connection as a result of sh shelling uh, of Ukraine energy infrastructure in October, December 2022. Uh, this is the led to spontaneous uh, transformation, of course, from uh, assisted teaching with uh, three online uh, sessions uh, with trainers from to stand alone course uh, due to uh, the inability to the majority of students to connect uh, at the schedule uh, time. Uh, 45 students from different faculties, uh, uh, psychology faculty, medicine institute, journalist institute, legal um, uh, institute, social work, and uh, economy faculty were invited in this project. Uh, 32 students successfully completed the course and were uh, assessed. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I want to draw your attention uh, to two important uh, points. Uh, first, uh, our study suggests uh, the curricula of different departments in Ukrainian university would benefit from including the evidence-based online course INAP for students in the field on prevention science. And uh, uh, the second, uh, the online format of this course is especially useful in the current situation uh, due to Russian invasion for Ukrainian student uh, who is a refugee uh, uh, abroad and in other region uh, of Ukraine uh, who is internally displaced person. Uh, when constant problem with connection due to power outage after Russian uh, bombing.
After uh, of, uh, at the end of this project, we started implementation. I NAP in pre-graduate uh, educational setting. As a first step, we implemented in program for master students specialty psychology, and we plan continue uh, our activity in other university, our faculty, our university, and other university uh, in uh, Ukraine. Um, ITTC Ukraine translated uh, 10 UTC trainers manual to Ukrainian into Ukrainian. Uh, four of them are under review and one has been prepared for posting of the website. Uh, information UTC uh, from one to five were included in curricula psychiatry narcology for a fourth year medical student. Uh, we have uh, now 10 hours uh, edition psychiatry, uh, 2 hours lecture and 8 hours uh, seminars and uh, um, 20, uh, 208 uh, fourth year students from Iran, Iraq, Pakistan and China completed this course. Uh, also, uh, we uh, in our institute uh, has approved three educational programs for postgraduate education. Uh, the first program, Diagnostic and Treatment of uh, Mental Disorders Comorbid with Substance Use, Screening and Brief Intervention, and Practice of Motivational, motivational Interviewer. And uh, in our institute, uh, um, 293 psychiatrists and addiction uh, psychiatrists um, completed this course. Uh, I would like uh, to tell some words about our perspective. At the suggestion of uh, the editor of the Lancet Psychiatry, a group of commissioners uh, is currently working uh, in Ukraine to write the Lancet Psychiatry Commission on Mental Health Care and Research in Ukraine. The issue of addiction psychiatry include in uh, this topic uh, um, mental health. I am a co-chair of this commission. Uh, 45 uh, specialists from all the world uh, work in this commission. We have uh, five groups. Uh, one group is training and edu uh, education, and this group uh, consists from three subgroup, uh, psychiatry from medical students, specialist training in psychiatry, continuous professional training in psychiatry. Commissioners uh, in, those, in this group are members of ITTC Ukraine, and uh, our national trainers, and we plan to discuss, implement uh, the uh, curricula of substance use prevention in treatment uh, in uh, this uh, very important document. This article uh, will be um, a strategic uh, document for Ukraine uh, because um, uh, in this article will the current situation and country, the goals uh, that the Ukraine should uh, strive for and the gaps and problems that need to be addressed uh, uh, will be indicated. And uh, um, also we would like to uh, discuss about the implementation in new educational program with our new coordination center under the Cabinet Ministry of uh, Ukraine. Uh, now, according uh, due to war, we have a possibility to change our educational program. And one minute. Yeah, one minute. I would like to say um, uh, some photos about our life uh, during uh, 2022 and uh, 2023. Um, this is the Kiev, March 2022, rail station. Uh, now, uh, 22 million Ukrainian uh, people were forced uh, to leave uh, their homes. Uh, this is a photo of our hospitals after the Russian attacks. Uh, Izum, um, uh, Mykolaiv, uh, uh, Maternity Hospital, Mariupol. This is the city Dnipro. Uh, the Ukrainian was sleeping in their home uh, when the Russian uh, missile attacks. Uh, this is uh, we in shelters and uh, underground. This is a blackout. It was very difficult, a dark time, and we understand uh, that in this year uh, the situation will not will better. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, the explosion of uh, Kachovska hydroelectric power plants. But uh, we believe in our uh, victory. Uh, we uh, will protect our independence. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Pinchuk. And what um, Arena didn't mention is she has been working nonstop in Kyiv this whole time during the, the uh, Russian invasion. There have been times when she has been on Zoom calls with us, and then she's gone into the shelter and come back and done a webinar, and it's really quite impressive. So thank you for your dedication. Next, we have Dr. Goodman Sebeko. Uh, Dr. Sebeko serves as an associate professor and head of addiction psychiatry at the University of Cape Town and as the director of the International Technology Transfer Center in South Africa, his favorite job. His work has focused on interventions using non-specialist workers in the management of severe mental illness, and he has a developing research portfolio focused on task-sharing models for the treatment of harmful substance use, mental health, and HIV. And it doesn't say this in his bio, but I'll say he has led the development of a pretty groundbreaking um, app. I don't know if you're going to talk about it at all in this presentation, but you should ask him about it. It's, it's quite impressive and a model for the, for the world. So, thank you, Dr. Sibiko. Thanks, everyone. So I wear a few hats. Today I'm speaking um, as a member of the uh, ICDDR South Africa. Um, so the title really is about University of Cape Town um, and the ICUDDR South Africa is largely based at the University of Cape Town and we are expanding and this is really what this talk is about. So we're going to talk a little bit about who the South African University stakeholders are. We'll talk about the needs assessment that was conducted and by the way I should mention uh, Dr. Johanna Kader is in the room and she's uh, contributed to the development of, of these slides. So we'll talk about the needs assessment, uh, we'll talk about um, the UTC walkthrough as a strategy for collecting data about what we need to do for uh, the next steps um, to integrate uh, the universal treatment curriculum into teaching in South Africa. So we won't go into too much detail, it's a very busy slide, but the key information is that in South Africa we have 26 universities, 21 universities with behavioral science uh, faculty and five technical universities, so in total uh, 50 facilities that provide training for the higher health sector. Um, I'd sent a request to our Department of, of Higher Education for a number of um, students in higher education, but they haven't responded. I suspect they're still asleep. <laughs> so I, I think as soon as they do, I can sort of let you know. So in terms of co-occurring disorders in South Africa, because as you know, um, addiction struggles to have funding on its own, so it tends to be lumped in with mental health conditions. So the best way to, uh, to uh, tackle it is by considering the co-occurring uh, disorders of mental health and substance use. So these are governed in South Africa by the National Mental Health Policy Framework, the substance um, uh, 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 policy which I, uh, is not listed there, as well as the drug master plan which sits under that policy. Part of the problem we have in South Africa is that the custodians of substance use treatment are divided into two sectors, so the social development sector and the health sector. That has implications for funding um, and our success in entrenching best practice uh, because the two departments work quite independently and it's often difficult to get them to sing the same tune. The uh, such study which was conducted long, long ago, uh, I was still in medical school at this time, 2002-2004, the last um, significant epidemiological study conducted in South Africa already indicated uh, a significant lifetime prevalence of substance use disorders in South Africa. And it also indicated that mental health disorders were more prevalent in individuals with substance use disorders. More than 50% of uh, clients with mental health uh, concerns present with co-occurring disorders, so have comor comorbid substance use disorders. And the uh, Sekendu data uh, which shows treatment demand data for substance use in South Africa, indicates 15% um, of folks who come in for treatment 
uh, report uh, co-occurring disorders. So the app that Laurie is talking about is, is, is intended to assist South Africa in collecting passive risk uh, profile across the country. And that'll give us uh, an additional uh, ability to visualize the levels of risk. So not, those, not just those that are indicated by the Sekendu data, which only shows treatment demand data, but it allows us to collect passive data across uh, uh, multiple context uh, uh, areas, across social development and health. Uh, so folks who haven't gone in for assistance who might be at risk. So ICUDDR South Africa was um, developed to, uh, to close the gap by looking at the provision of integrated treatment for co-occurring disorders. Um, and to build a network of universities and other training institutes, um, as well as then um, to target all nine provinces. So as much as the talk is really about the University of Cape Town, we often get accused as University of Cape Town because we're the top university in Africa, the most publications, the most uh, well recognized of being elitist. So we try actively to engage other partners and to make sure that we incorporate collaborative uh, techniques. And so. That's why this talk, as much as it's UCT, is focused on the whole country. Um, and what we are excited about is that we do finally have recognition of um, addiction psychiatry as a specialty by the Health Professions Council, but we don't have this yet for registered counselors and psychologists. And this is part of the work that ICD the RSA is busy trying to do, to close the gap and provide uh, a, a sufficiently capacitated workforce. Only uh, of all of those 50 universities, only two in South Africa provide training um, in addiction, and that's University of Cape Town and University of Stellenbosch. So uh, in my division, we have the uh, postgraduate diploma in addictions care, as well as the MPhil in addictions for uh, psychiatrists who are subspecializing in addiction. Um, our colleagues um, at the Social uh, Development Department, the humanity, uh, Humanities Faculty, provide a postgraduate honors, in diploma, uh, honors diploma in addictions while our friends at University of Stellenbosch, similarly to us, provide a master's in addiction as well as a postgraduate diploma in addictions care. So there's a real gap. So we don't want to be the only two universities who have these credentialed uh, uh, capacity building interventions. But what are the other programs? So there are other programs that are in place. In Pretoria, we've got the community-oriented substance use program, which looks at providing community-based uh, capacity building, technical assistance uh, for best practice substance use. We also then have clinical associates uh, through University of Pretoria and a module in the fifth year of medical st uh, for medical students. Uh, the Sefago Mahato Health Sciences University provides teaching to medical students uh, and the University of Western Cape provides uh, training to community health workers and lay workers. So this is clearly insufficient to cover the whole country. So um, what my colleagues and I did was then conduct a needs assessment. Uh, in terms of the methodology, it was to identify the key objectives of capacity building for substance use disorder in South Africa, to identify uh, the key constituencies for, um, uh, for sampling, uh, and then to select, uh, develop an instrument for that data collection and then analyze and disseminate that data. I know there's a paper that's currently in, 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 um, in submission and the data that I present here today, it really speaks to uh, the findings. So the team then developed a 33 item electronic survey, uh, which was then um, uh, distributed to heads of departments. <laughs> uh, I wasn't even jet lagged yet when I made the slide, but I still made a typo. Um, to lecturers and to co course coordinators, and HDREC was achieved through um, Stellenbosch University. So overwhelmingly, the departments that provide capacity building in South Africa, even in an incomplete form in, in, our, in our eyes, are psychology departments and, and social work departments. So there's clearly a gap as well in the medical side. So uh, medical trainees are not receiving adequate uh, training. So you can see that represented in this slide. In terms of where the teaching takes place. We mentioned there's piecemeal uh, curricula being um, uh, delivered in uh, routine teaching of medical students and some registrar teaching or, or residence as you would call it. But most of it is undergraduate courses. Uh, and of course those masters and postgraduate diplomas uh, or, or degrees uh, which are presented at University of Stellenbosch and University of Cape Town. What is alarming is there's such a huge chunk that do not provide any. And so, in terms of the general themes across curricula which are offered, um, these uh, you know, cover prevention, detection, and management. Um, 
The challenges people have reported is that, uh, or, or that we elicited, was that there's no standardization of training. Um, you know, there's no uh, sort of clear graduate level uh, across. So there's no uh, standardization of, of the qualification level that folks will uh, escape teaching with. There's no consistency in length, focus, and assessment. But what is heartening is that 90%, 97% of folks who completed our survey were ready to implement. And you can see that uh, there is adequate capacity, although that could be better, uh, to provide that teaching. Um, and of course, you see that the, the targets for assistance were pr pretty evenly spread out between enhancing teaching capacity, improving uh, uh, existing capacity, and development of new curricula. So in terms of the curriculum development interest, uh, people want to know theory. They want to know about screening and diagnosis. They want to know about acute and post-acute care strategies, integration, dual diagnosis, or so co-occurring disorders, uh, medication-assisted treatment, as well as policy and research. So how do we do this? How do we address these needs? We started by conducting a UTC walkthrough in April 2022. That's why we're all wearing masks. Uh, in beautiful Cape Town. Please come and visit us and bring your money to the city. Uh, so this, this UTC walkthrough was funded by ICUDDR, facilitated by ICUDDR, so is representing a collaboration between University of Cape Town, ITT South Africa, and it was supported by ISAP South Africa, really as part of the uh, drug demand reduction collaborative that we formed in the country. Uh, Global Master Trainer for Colombo Plan, Rohana was there, and also UNODC. It was held in Cape Town, over seven days. So these are the modules that were covered in the training. The goals were to develop a network of universities um, engaged in designing and implementing ac academic curricula and programs in addiction uh, prevention and treatment based on the uh, UTC and UPC. So we're offering them a best practice living curriculum so they don't have to start from scratch. And they're also getting the option to integrate as required by their programs. Ultimately, we would like to see consistency, but at the moment, it's really about meeting their, their needs and addressing their gaps. Facilitating networking, making sure that, you know, networks such as ISAP teach us how to make sure that practitioners are well-networked and well-connected and have access to resources such as the teaching and uh, technical assistance capacity that exists in our network. And is then to conduct these walkthrough trainings to enable continued integration and review. So at the training, we had folks from uh, private universities as well as public health uh, or public universities. As you can see, this list is not long enough. That's why we're planning to do follow-up uh, walkthroughs to cover those that we have not. Um, so that we, the feedback we received is folks wanted to see more HIV content because it's important for our country. They wanted to see um, better links between GBV and SUD or gender-based violence rather and substance use disorder, also topical for us community level considerations, traditional considerations which are very important in the African context, as I'm sure they are in, in this context, as well as advocacy and social justice. There are also, of course, structural issues that they reported that they'd like to see ad addressed, such as accreditation being a very key one to make it worth people's while to actually engage in, in SUD capacity building. And of course, the others are listed there. So the next steps, uh, each, each university that attended identified specific next steps, which I'm sure uh, in, the next time, in the next opportunity we have to engage with you, we'll be able to provide updates in terms of to, what the ex ex to the extent to which folks have been successful in implementing them. All of these, of course, depend on where each facility is in terms of implementing um, SUD teaching. So what are our next steps? Laurie, I'm doing very well. So what are our next steps? Uh, our next steps are to increase, uh, increase um, expand ICDR membership and access to the universal treatment curriculum and ultimately the UPC as well. We want to do follow-up walkthroughs. Uh, we want to increase collaboration, uh, design and, um, and maintain a supervision and mentoring framework, um, specifically focused on curriculum development and teaching and capacity building in general. We want to make sure we engage in regular engagements to reinforce established relationships. We want to foster DDR training provision. We must always remind ourselves not to use abbreviations. Drug demand reduction training provision to other med, uh, mental health care providers as well, besides psychology, because as you saw, psychology is overrepresented and medical profession isn't adequately represented. We want to strengthen our collaborations, and we're doing this actively. 
uh, with ISOP, um, ITGC, and the um, Sanka is a major treatment provider and a major partner for us in South Africa. And of course, to submit propo proposals for funding uh, to DOH and Department of Social Development, sorry, Department of Health, and Department of Social Development, um, and, and sort of advocate for integration of training into existing training initiatives. So I made it within 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sebeko. Now I'd like to bring up Dr. Sista. Dr. Christiana Sista is the head of the psychiatric department and head of the addiction psychiatry division and medical faculty at the University of Indonesia. Her research focuses on substance and behavioral addiction. She's particularly interested in neurocognitive function, adherence of treatment, genetics, and neuroimaging in patients with behavioral addiction and HIV AIDS. Since 2008, she has conducted several research projects in addiction psychiatry, such as cannabis, HIV AIDS, and internet addiction. Currently, she's developing a questionnaire in Bahasa for teenagers with internet addiction, whilst running a national survey for teenagers with internet addiction in Indonesia. Dr. Sista is also a member of the Indonesia ITTC team. Okay, thank you so much, <laughs> Laurie, for the nice uh, introduction. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christiana Sista, but you can call me Sista. And I'm here with our team from ITTC Indonesia, and also uh, my senior, Ibu Riza. So thank you to accompany us to present our work. So. Uh, what will we present uh, today about knowledge and skill building content across a network of Indonesian psychiatric training uh, programs? And okay. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is uh, ITTC in Indonesia. Uh, uh, this part of ITTC. Uh, are universities and then uh, NGO also and then hospital and also national narco uh, national narcotic uh, board in uh, we join in ITTC in Indonesia and um, this is as a background why uh, we um, join ITTC and then we develop uh, ITTC in Indonesia and why. Uh, addiction model should be included in the university, should be included in medical doctors' uh, curriculum. Because this is, uh, this is drug use situation in Indonesia, and this is the survey from uh, Nar National Narcotic uh, Board in 2021, and then uh, this is the estimated prevalence of drug use in the past year, uh, around 1.95%, uh, and it, uh, we had uh, around 7,000 uh, participants, so it's in, it was included all region in Indonesia. And then the survey, uh, this is the result of the survey, 14% of them use cigarette, and then 9% of them use alcohol, and 1.5% of them use drugs. It's including uh, illegal drugs and also uh, prescription uh, drugs. So we can see here, this is adolescents and adults' comparison of using uh, drugs. Oh. Okay. Uh, and we can see here the uh, last part, this one. This is uh, adolescent and the blue one is adult. And this is a prescription drug like uh, tramadol and also like antihistamine and also about um, uh, like uh, benzodiazepine especially Abrazolam. So during COVID-19, maybe the drugs uh, cannot access uh, easily, but prescription drug can be accessed uh, easily, especially for adolescents and also young adults. And of course, uh, because substance use disorder are chronic mental condition, and the problem is about treatment gap. Uh, and we can see here, we are from lower middle and low income country. Compared to upper middle income and high income country, so the treatment gap in our country is very big, is very huge. And then the question is, who are responsible for this treatment in our country? 
And uh, we know that in sustainable development goals in target three until five, there is about prevention and treat uh, substance abuse. And uh, this slide show lack of mental health specialists in Indonesia hinders treat, uh, treatment coverage. So we can see here in Indonesia, very low compared to other low middle income country. And we can see here in the right uh, side, I think this is PDF, sorry. So uh, in the right side, so this is our current uh, situation. This is Indonesian current training for psychiatrists. This is the projection number of psychiatrists in our country. And the blue one is the current uh, situation. So uh, if we want to be like this one in the green one, so we should uh, uh, multiple three times compare this uh, now situation. So we can uh, produce more psychiatrists to give the treatment for addiction, uh, medicine, addiction cases. And here we can uh, see that uh, psychiatrists focus just in uh, Java and Bali Island. So we have many islands in Indonesia and six province in our country. Uh, this is the ratio about psychiatrists and population ratio. One compare more than 500 uh, people in our country. So this is very small number psychiatrists in our country. And in our country, uh, there are nine universities uh, who provide uh, psychiatric education, and two universities uh, provide subspecialized specialized program for uh, addiction psychiatry. And this is the profile of uh, my university, University of Indonesia. This is the oldest faculty of medicine in Indonesia. And this is the Indonesian doctor education uh, pathway. So to be a psychiatrist, we need uh, six years to be medical doctor, and then one year for internship program, and four years for specialized uh, program, and then two years to be sub-specialization for psychiatric, addiction psychiatry. So we need more than 10 years to be sub-specialized uh, addiction psychiatry. And uh, this is a general for a medical doctor in our uh, country. So uh, in my university, a uh, medical doctor, uh, undergraduate uh, student, they have four weeks of uh, rotation in the psychiatry department. And then uh, the competency uh, included to diagnose and to give early treatment for acute intox intoxication of psychoactive uh, substances and substance use disorder for non-emergency and alcohol or substance induced uh, delirium. So just for diagnose and early treatment and they will refer to the higher hospital. And also we have a postgraduate uh, study. So in uh, this is uh, the student who want to be psychiatrist after they are being medical doctor. And we have uh, addiction module in the first semester and then a fourth semester and in seventh semester for two months. And we collaborate with uh, National Narcotic Board for uh, seven semester. They stay in the uh, national, in the very big rehabilitation uh, belongs to National Narcotic Board for uh, two weeks there. And then we have subspecialist uh, program. Uh, this is psychiatric postgraduate program. And uh, they also have rotation in Indonesian National Narcotic Board for one month. And also they have opportunity to attend the international conference and elective rotation abroad. And also we have case discussion very intensive for subspecialist program. And this is the different competencies between general psychiatric and addiction uh, psychiatric. So it's uh, depend on uh, the competency. General psychiatrics are uh, more about screening and giving brief intervention and pharmacological treatment, diagnosis, psychotherapy, and also they can uh, do advocacy uh, to the government. But for subspecialist program or addiction psychiatrists, they should manage complex cases in addiction psychiatry, like for the risk population, uh, for teenager, uh, children, and also women, and also geriatric patient. And also pregnant women and uh, patient with dual diagnosis or patient uh, use drug more than one uh, kind of drugs. 
and this is the learning method we use online case discussion during COVID-19 and also we have international case discussion especially with Flinders University in Australia and also Korihama Medical Center in Japan and this is also the learning me uh, methods we have elective modules so we send the student to uh, the international um, uh, medical center like uh, Kurihama Medical Center and also Flinders University. And also we encourage them to do academic writing and publication and uh, they should publish in international journal, especially for uh, the unique uh, research like using TMS for addiction patient, uh, especially for methamphetamine use disorder. And this is all, uh, the challenge in education, uh, especially for subspecialist program because they come from uh, any region in Indonesia, so they need more uh, cost to be in Jakarta. And our government does not focus on psychiatric education, so there is uh, just a few scholarship uh, to uh, do the subspecialist program, especially in addiction psychiatry. And uh, this is uh, the other uh, module from other university, uh, Sharif Hidayatullah Jakarta. They focus on uh, undergraduate student. Uh, they also focus on prevention. So uh, they focus on prevention for drug use in the community. And this is also the uh, example from Atmajaya Catholic University. They also have four-week elective block in uh, for addiction module. And uh, this is uh, for undergraduate medical uh, student. Also from University of Pajajaran, they have um, eye scan module. So this is the module for addiction medicine, especially for general practitioner. And they should uh, study for six months. And after that, they have skill to uh, manage the uh, basic of uh, addiction cases. And also from drug dependent hospital, Jakarta, so they have collaboration with several university and giving uh, skill to manage addiction cases. And this is uh, our national drug dependent hospital. So they have many complex and very difficult case. And uh, from national narcotic board, uh, national narcotic boards also they do many trainings, especially for medical doctor and also non-professional uh, healthcare uh, like counselor and they uh, did the training uh, around uh, Indonesia, so many provinces in Indonesia. And uh, at last part, I would like to introduce this module because uh, psychiatrist uh, number is very low, also medical number who interest in addiction is very low. So the training for non-health uh, professional is very important. So then uh, I collaborate with Kyoto University, we developed this module, a new community-based psychotherapy for substance use disorder in Indonesia, and uh, we use online applic application during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, why we uh, develop, develop this module? Because we know there is the treatment gap, and uh, we need the uh, evidence-based uh, module to treat the, uh, the treat, to treat the substance use disorder. And with this module, uh, we try uh, to include the peer counselor from NGO, and uh, they, and we develop and evaluate community-based CBT program for substance use disorder. Uh, we adapted from uh, Japan. They use this module in the prison, and we adapted to Indonesia in Indonesian uh, context. And uh, this module develop a program which can be provided by non-specialized for counselor and they have been training for UPC and also UTC and evaluate the program with transdisciplinary design. And uh, in this module, uh, we for, uh, the first step of uh, the um, evaluate by the psychiatrist and then we also include the other psychiatrists in the regional hospital including uh, the north uh, province in Indonesia and the western uh, province in Indonesia so we include the hospital around Indonesia and also we involve the uh, GP uh, general practitioner and also we involve the peer counselor in the community from uh, NGO 
and uh, as I mentioned before, we adapt from uh, a module from Japan, especially for methamphetamine user. And then uh, this is the study site and program uh, structure. We have three hospital and three rehabilitation center involved in this research. And we have uh, group therapy, not one by one, but group therapy. There are five persons in group therapy, five until five pers uh, five until ten per uh, ten person in one group therapy, and two hours weekly online session. And we have twelve session. Uh, it needs three months. There is one facilitator and one peer counselor, and we already published the protocol, and this is the result. So for the result, uh, for the patient uh, with in the with the module online module, and also we uh, also we give therapy as usual like methadone or uh, uh, suboxone, but we use CBT online. So the abstinence from primary drug is significant compared to the group without uh, the CBT, online CBT. It's about 8.1 uh, days for the group uh, with uh, the online CBT. And also we use ASI and the group with the online CBT, there is a decreasing uh, score, especially for psychiatric uh, severity uh, compared to the other group without online CBT. So. Uh, we think this is a very important module and we can involve non-professional healthcare. So not just medical doctor or psychiatrist, but uh, the pre consular from NGO is very important for us. And as conclusion, so to close the treatment gap, it's not just the responsibility from the university. It's not just responsibility for the psychiatrist or medical doctor, but we need more collaboration. That's why we join in ITTC Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm actually going to ask if the speakers wanted to just pull a chair up in front so that we can uh, talk to you about uh, if you have any questions or comments. Thanks, Sherry, for helping. Okay, and then uh, Verna has a mic for the audience. So if you have questions over there. Thank you to all speakers. Uh, my name is Dimitri Krupchanka. I'm from WHO headquarters. And I really enjoyed all your talks, beautiful examples of programs and activities you have in your countries. And I like that. Uh, I think uh, in South Africa you said there's a lack of standardization, but also Ukraine. Uh, your desk review shows there are so many programs across different universities, they cover different things. And I think also for Vietnam you presented a beautiful program, but I guess it's not implemented in many other places in your country, right? So my question would be to all of you, what are the prospects, or what are the opportunities and challenges to have a standardized national kind of curricular frameworks in, the, in your country. Is there interest in the government uh, to work on that? Uh, thank you. So I guess I have the mic, so I'll start quickly. Um, I think the trouble for us is the fragmentation of, of substance use management, that the custodians where the, all the funding goes is Department of Social Development, but a lot of the medical treatment is conducted by Department of Health, but with no funding. Um, and in terms of credentialing and in terms of uh, getting accreditation uh, through the Health Professions Council, that's a challenge that we're trying to tackle. So it's, you know, the custodians of capacity building as well. So we have the colleges of medicine who provide um, specialist training for, um, to develop psychiatrists. We have um, the medical, medical schools that provide undergraduate teaching. There's not a great history of good, strong collaboration between them. I think it's also questions of IP and, 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 you know, sort of protecting one's turf. So I think this is, you know, ITTC, when, when we started a few years ago, I think we started to show people that it's possible to collaborate and develop products that don't belong to one person but that the country can benefit from. 
And we think that that relationship with ICDDR hopefully will give people a sense that it is possible to pull together. So we don't have an immediate answer to that, but it's something that it takes time, as you know, to work with policymakers to change the ways in which they work. But that's definitely what we're trying to do in South Africa. Thank you very much for questions. Uh, in Ukraine now, uh, we have uh, possibility as uh, ITTC Ukraine has worked uh, in Ukraine during uh, uh, five years, and uh, uh, I sub national chapter. We have a lot of we have. Uh, access uh, for to the uh, information. Uh, now we um, started cooperate uh, with um, uh, Ministry of Education, and uh, um, Deputy uh, Ministry decided to change all the educational program in Ukraine. And um, unfortunately, but the situation in our country gives us opportunity uh, addiction psychiatry, change education, uh, educational program in addiction psychiatry. Uh, we uh, think uh, about organized uh, coordination uh, center in the uh, university uh, in Kiev and started with different university in Ukraine for implement uh, uh, the program uh, UTC, UPC. Um, this year we translated into Ukrainian a lot of uh, material and now uh, we will uh, work with uh, the second step implemented this program in our university. Yeah, thank you for the question. So it's very difficult to include the addiction model in um, medical student. I mean, undergraduate student. It's very difficult. We should fight in the in the collegium. Uh, but it's more easier. It easier for uh, including the module in a psychiatric uh, program and also subspecialist program. So we try to combine UPC and UTC to subspecialist program. And then for the like medical doctor or uh, for um, the other professional like uh, psychology, uh, psychologist and also um, a peer counselor, I mean a counselor. So there are uh, regularly training for them every year. So we try to diverse the, uh, the module and I, I see the national, national uh, narcotic drugs also do that to other uh, professional, uh, except medical doctor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, so as a country with a communist government, uh, we always like uniformity and, and, and standards, right? Uh, but there are many challenges. Um, so one of the, the list of which is that we don't have a society of addiction medicine that determine the curriculum determine the standard curriculum and so on. So everything uh, like um, our colleague from other countries mentioned, it sort of uh, varies among capacity of different university and so on. So here I, I, I would pose a, a um, I would like to ask WHO uh, to help and uh, set up a, a recommendation to the uh, Minister of Health of, of the member state to uh, develop some uh, curriculum standard in addiction and in mental health for undergraduate and graduate students. Because sometimes the Ministry of Health in country like us, they like WHO recommendation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon maybe now. Um, Thank you very much for your presentations. I very much enjoyed it. Um, my name is Carmel Clancy. I'm working in the UK uh, I as a dean in a faculty I in North London uh, for health and social care. Um, so we have social workers, nurses, teachers. Um, but I also am the president of the International Nurses Society on Addictions. So I would be really interested in your view about the role of nurses in terms of their training. I hear and I understand uh, a lot of focus is often on the medical training um, and I often hear psychologists also and I hear counselors. I don't often hear nurses. Um, and given we have 27 million nurses in the world, 
which makes up 50% of the health workforce. I think nurses have a role, I hope you agree, but I think we have a lot of work to do together uh, on how we support, train, and I would be very interested in your view about where you think uh, things are for nursing, particularly in your countries. Thank you. Oh, great. So I'll try and be super quick. So Laurie's going to get me in trouble. Well, you've got me in trouble with Laurie because she said I should talk to INSA ages ago, and I think you know this. Um, look, I, I, I think um, part, of, part of your role is to keep us in check. Uh, I mean, I mean you, you, based on what our needs assessment shows, I think it also spoke to our own um, biases, right? So that's represented in the absence of nursing responses. So thank you for checking us on that. But I think when we've developed um, protocols in South Africa, we've just finalized our protocols for opioid substitution therapy. Um, and a very significant component of that is case management, it's, um, it's, it's, it's recovery support. Um, so there's that, certainly that very key element for nursing um, in general, but also around co-occurring disorders uh, to provide support in that way. Um, how the health system in South Africa is being oriented now is that the nurses are being strengthened in terms of their capacity to detect and provide early interventions. There's also, you know, we've, we've started providing uh, nurses with capacity to prescribe a uh, ARVs and, and, and sort of and dish them out as well. We would like to see the same happen for antidepressants uh, and ultimately things like um, agonist treatment for, uh, for um, opioid uh, use disorders. So you're very right, there's an obvious role. Um, you know, we talk about task shifting and task sharing all the time, but I think we do need to sort of reimagine what we're saying there. I think when you say task shifting and task sharing, it gets people's backs up. What we're talking about is a collaborative care model where each, each, each stakeholder's role is pretty clear, and we know that nurses are across the board, and so we do need to be more mindful of how we incorporate them. So I agree with you. Thank you very much for uh, your questions. Uh, as I said in my presentation, we have uh, a biggest problem uh, with educational program for uh, nurses. Uh, and uh, we uh, understood that, uh, this uh, problem and we will decide. Uh, but uh, I would like um, uh, to say uh, we think about organized uh, multidisciplinary educational program because in Ukraine we have experience um, um, mobile uh, mental health uh, uh, teams and uh, these form very useful during period of COVID and war. And uh, in Ukraine now we have not nothing uh, multidisciplinary uh, educational program for uh, addiction psychiatry um, in our country. The first uh, uh, pay attention uh, uh, educational program for, for nurses and change. And second, uh, organized uh, uh, multidisciplinary educational program. Okay, thank you for the comment, comment and uh, question. I really do agree the nurse has a very important role to manage the addiction case. And in Indonesia, we have a specialist in mental health uh, program for nurse. And we put addiction uh, module in that uh, program. But it's not a huge uh, part. Uh, it's still a small part, but it is very important to uh, put in. And we have also the um, specialized uh, training for the nurse, especially uh, in the hospital, in the National uh, Dependent Drugs. Uh, my friend, Dr. Emelda, worked there. So they uh, do regularly training for the nurse. But yes, we should improve the curriculum, of course. Thank you. Um, I, I have no further uh, um, points to add to the education of nurses and, and and their uh, importance in, in the addiction uh, care and treatment. But I do want to emphasize the nursing research on addiction. And um, I've tried to uh, uh, encourage the faculty in our university from nursing department to um, nursing faculty to uh, conduct research on addiction. But uh, when they uh, talk about the topics of research, they always go back to the kind of research that um, uh, doctors or psychologists usually conduct, right? So the question is how we can develop a, 
a, a, a profile of research for, for nursing faculty. And I would love to hear from all of you about the models of, of research that, um, that the nurses can, can contribute and, and really show that, that the, the research that they do is really important for Dixon Field. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And I'll just say I appreciated the last question because I actually, my, I am faculty in a school of nursing and health studies although I'm the in health studies part, but I always appreciate the nursing perspective. <laughs> so please, yes, yes, last question. Thank you for uh, giving me a time. So my name is Darawan. I came from the University of, uh, Burapa University Faculty of Nursing. So I would like to share about the program training for nurse and multidisciplinary team also. We have uh, some little part in a bachelor degree of nursing, but not too much. But when they graduate from bachelor degree, we have um, th two or three days training and uh, four months training, and also train them in a master degree also, and also in uh, in a PhD program, and. Uh, I'm now uh, came with my dean, uh, Faculty of Nursing, Burapa University. So I'm act as a director of Eastern Substance Abuse Center. So uh, this is the first year of uh, this center. So we have a training program for substance abuse. For example, to decrease depression, anxiety, to try to help them prevention and decrease uh, mental health problem or something like that. And in our center, we have four uh, psychothera psycho psychotherapy for helping uh, the uh, substance abuse, to, to, do, to decrease to using substance abuse. Uh, the first program is about uh, using cognitive behavior therapy to uh, help them. And the second is about the uh, problem solving therapy, PST. The third is about the act, act art. Art is A-R-T, art. And act is uh, acceptance commitment therapy. And um, we also got the research, and I would like, to, I'm so interested uh, to open for the researcher from anywhere to work together in our research. Now, uh, our center have four, we on process of four research. Um, and if you are interested, we have poster downstairs. Uh -huh. And then uh, I put some uh, detail on that. And Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It sounds like we have some need to exchange some business cards here. Um, Verna, you had one question, but very quickly, and then we need... Um, yeah, that can, can share the experience. Maybe the next ICU-DDR meeting. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great idea, yes. And it is time for lunch, so I'm sure if you want to come and uh, ask Dr. Zhang more questions, he'd be welcome to that. Thank you all. Please give a round of applause to our speakers. We appreciate your talks today, and have a, have a good rest of your day. Please also don't forget to evaluate our QR code. is right yes, there. Yes, please, the as you walk out, scan the QR code. We need you to do the evaluation, please.